A very good evening one and all. I welcome you all to Ganesh IAS Academy. In today's session, we will be seeing environment based current affairs from the date August 25th to August 31, 2023. Let us get into the news articles one by one. The first news for the day is State of India's Births Report 2023. What is this report? Who has released this report? And what is its significance? All those details we must have to understand. Let us get into the details. Sorry. Yes. State of India's Bird 2023. This is the report. Recently, this report has been released by the collaborative efforts of 13 government and non-governmental organizations and what is the significance of the report and what is this report highlighting it is saying that despite thriving of a few bird species there is a substantial decrease in the bird species numerous bird species are showing substantial decrease in its population and there are some birds which are thriving, which means they are their population is stable. Okay, so we must have to understand which type of birds are facing threats and which type of birds are safe and they are stable. That's that distinction we must have to understand. And the bodies or the organization who has taken efforts to create this report, they are the main ones are Bombay Natural History Society, Wildlife Institute of India. Zoological Survey of India, Wildlife Trust of India and Wildlife, sorry, Worldwide Fund for Nature, WWF India. Okay, so these are the main of these 13, the major ones are these organizations and what are they doing? They are taking efforts for conservation status of the most of the regularly occurring bird species in India. Okay, so they are evaluating the conservation status of these birds, the regularly occurring bird species in India. Okay, so furthermore, understanding is needed. What are all the methodologies used in this report? First thing is they have taken data from bird watchers. Approximately 30,000 bird watchers have given their data for this report, and then there are three primary indices based on which this assessment is made. First thing is long term trend, which means if there is any observation changed, I mean an observation made over the past, I mean over the past 30 years, then that is called as long term trend. Okay, so change over 30 years, an observation which is made over the past 30 years is long term trend next is current annual trend current annual trend means change over the past seven years so if there is any change observed in the past seven years then that is called as current annual trend and then distribution range size within india so within india the distribution range all these three are the indices which are used for assessing birds in india in this particular report Next, what are all the key highlights of the report? First, coming to the status of the birds. Like we saw, we have two different types of index. Okay. First thing is long term trend and second is current trend, current annual trend. And of the 338 species which is identified with long term trend, 60% have experienced declines. 29% are stable and 11% have shown increase and of 359 species that has been determined with current annual trends, okay, of those 39% are declining, 18% are rapidly declining and 53% are stable and the rest 8% are increasing, okay. So, these data are important. Next is increasing birth species which means bird species which is so showing consistent increase in its population or its population is stable. First thing is despite general decline, 
there are some positive trends yes the best example for this is Indian pea fowl that is a national bird peacock right okay that is also called as Indian pea fowl it is showing a remarkable increase in both abundance and distribution okay so peacock is growing in its numbers it is showing remar remarkable increase in its abundance and also in distribution which means it is getting distributed to various other spots in which it has not been found earlier okay so it has expanded its range into newer habitats okay it is going to new habitats like high altitude himalayan regions and also rainforest regions in western ghats high altitude himalayan regions they are found and also they are found in rainforest regions of western ghats generally peacocks are found in grasslands okay but then they are also found in high altitude regions and also rainforest regions of western ghats these are the two new habitats of Indian pea fowl. Okay. <coughs> Next is there are other species of birds like Asian coil, house crow, rock pigeon, and Alexandrian parakeet. These are also showing an increase, notable increase in its abundance since the year 2000. And there are two different types of birds like specialist and generalist. What is the difference between specialist and generalist? When it's rest i mean when its habitat is restricted to certain areas that is called as specialist but otherwise which means its habitat is not restricted to certain areas but it is also <coughs> having a wide range of habitat then that is called as generalist <coughs> sorry so when it is restricted to certain habitats like wetlands rainforest and grasslands then those are specialists I'm sorry. And the observation made in this report is specialist is showing decline in its um, population. Okay, so this is what you have to understand. Specialists are showing decline in its population. <coughs> sorry. When it comes to generalist, that is. Generalist that is birds that can live in multiple habitat types, then they are doing well as a group, which means they are performing well as a group in the sense they are doing, I mean its population is consistently stable as a group and specialists however are more threatened than generalists, obviously, right. Even in one of our previous session, I would have discussed about Uri Haline and Uri Thermal. Uh, uh, and then steno haline and steno thermal. What is uri and uh, steno organisms? That is those organisms which have different kind of adaptabilities. Okay, <coughs> you can go have a look at those videos. Next is grassland species have declined by more than fifty percentage. This is also important. Next, birds that are woodland specialists. What are woodland specialists? Those birds which grow in forest or plantation areas are called as woodland specialists. They have also shown decline more than the generalist and then it indicates that there is a need to conserve natural forest habitats so that they provide habitat to these specialists which are <coughs> I mean to which the special need is uh, required. Next migrant and resident birds. Migratory birds, there are many migratory birds and among migratory birds there are two distinct variants that is long distance migrants and then short distance migrants and <coughs> the long distance migrants that is those birds which come from Eurasia and Arctic region to India, they are experiencing significant declines by more than 50 percentage which is followed by the short distance migrants and then there are also shore birds. Shore birds which are breeding in the Arctic regions, they are also showing a decline by close to 80 percentage. All these statements can be directly asked in your prelims examination. This trend can be asked in your prelims examination. That is why this topic becomes important. And by co contrast, residents, that is those species which are resident of a particular area, they are not migrating 
they are not uh, having this migration as an adaptation those birds are called as resident species and they have remained much more stable when compared to the migrants okay <clears throat> Next, diet and decline pattern. So, is there any link between the diet taken by the birds and its population decline or its population increase? Yes, there is a direct link. For example, dietary requirements of the birds have also shown up in the abundance trend like we saw. And then the birds that feed on vertebrates and carrions. What are carrion? Carrions are flesh of dead animals is called as carrion. And then vertebrates we already know. Vertebrates are those organisms which have spinal cord, the basic understanding, okay. So, there are certain birds which feed on vertebrates like fishes, frogs and then also the dead bodies or the flesh, the dead, uh, I mean the flesh of the dead animals. When there is a bird which is going to feed on vertebrates and carry on, they are facing decline in its population. That is the report saying and then vultures nearly driven to extinction by consuming carcasses contaminated with diclofenac in one of our previous session i have discussed in detail about the vultures different types of vultures and what are all the chemicals that is causing death to vultures and what is the reason behind it the main reason is contamination with drugs veterinary drugs okay so when <coughs> The vultures are going to consume those dead animals which have been taking throughout its lifetime these drugs then it will also get affected by it. So this process is also called as biomagnification where a particular toxin is getting accumulated from one organism to another okay from when uh, an organism from higher tropic level is going to consume an organism from the lower tropic level then this happens okay next is there are species of vultures like white rumped vultures indian vultures and red headed uh, vultures which are facing maximum declines like 98 percentage 91 sorry 95 and 91 percentage respectively okay so <clears throat> this is a major environmental concern with respect to vultures that is use of veterinary drugs next is endemic and water birds what are endemic birds which are belonging to that particular area okay so those birds are called as endemic birds so endemic birds unique to western Ghats and sri lanka biodiversity hotspot they have experienced rapid decline okay so of 232 endemic species many are inhabitants of rainforest they are facing decline and this indicates that there must be preservation of habitat and then there are also ducks water birds when it comes to water birds we have ducks both resident and migratory even certain types of duck species are migratory species okay so here both resident and migratory ducks are declining and especially bayer's pochard and then common pochard and andaman teal what are these? These are duck species. Okay. A question can be asked from this point also. What are these? Like Bayer's pochard, common pochard, andaman teal. These are species of what? D duck. Okay. So they are all facing decline. They are all vulnerable. Next, riverine sandbar nesting birds are also declining. Okay. So there are certain areas called riverine sandbars. Okay. The sandbars which are formed in the river beds, they are also nesting beds are there. Okay, so the birds which are doing nesting in those areas, they are facing decline due to multiple pressure on the rivers. Next, major threats. This report has highlighted several major threats. The first thing is forest degradation. Yes urbanization of course and then energy infrastructure the best example for energy infrastructure here is windmills windmills is posing a great threat to birds next 
environmental pollutants like we saw veterinary drugs like nimesulide and then in the previous slide we saw diclofenac these are the drugs which are causing a huge problem for vultures okay they threat vulture population and then there are also climate change issues which is going to affect migratory species other than that avian disease happen okay like bird flu is going to happen are happening and then illegal hunting and trade is also happening to control this only we are having sites okay the convention sites okay so all these are major threats for birds are there any other species which is specifically mentioned here yes in this report sarus crane has been mentioned because its population is declining and then of the 11 species of woodpeckers 7 appear stable 2 are declining and 2 are in rapid decline and one best example here given is yellow crowned woodpecker which is showing more than 70 percentage decline in its population in the past three decades which is alarming okay so all these are important next comes bustards okay while half of the bustards all of the all over the world is threatened there are three bustard species which are breeding in india they are great indian bustard lesser floricon and bengal floricon and these three species of bustards are facing decline in population because they are most vulnerable so these are the bird species that has been mentioned in this particular report so this report becomes important from your exam point of view the next topic is <coughs> dolpur karawli tiger reserve why is this tiger reserve in news what is its significance because this tiger reserve has been recognized as the 54th tiger reserve of india okay so dolpur karawli tiger reserve where is it located it is located in the state of rajasthan all those details we have to understand national tiger conservation authority has established i mean has approved for the establishment of this dolpur karawli tiger reserve in the state of rajasthan and this uh, Tiger Reserve becomes the fifth tiger reserve of the state of Rajasthan. What are the other four? Mukundra Hills, Ramgar, Bishdar, Rantambore, and then Sariska. These are the four tiger reserves, and this becomes the fifth one. And all over India, this becomes 54th one. Okay. Next, what is a tiger reserve? Tiger reserves are those protected areas which are there for conservation of tigers. Okay. And this point is important. A tiger reserve may also be a national park or wildlife sanctuary. Okay. Statements like this are important from exam point. The best example here is Sariska Tiger Reserve. What is Sariska Tiger Reserve here? It is also a national park. Okay. That is why this example is given here. Even before it has been accorded this tiger reserve status, it was a national park. So, a tiger reserve may be a national park or it might be a wildlife sanctuary also. This point is important. Next is, this we have already discussed in one of our previous session. Here, we are briefly going to understand what is what. Okay. So, tiger reserves are notified by state government as per the provisions of section 38V of the Wildlife Protection Act of 1972 and it is based on the advice, it will be done on the advice of Tiger, National Tiger Conservation Authority. Okay, and as of now there are 54 tiger reserves and this becomes the latest one. Next is, India is home to 75 percentage of the world's tiger population and based on this 2020 report, there are, 2022 report, there are 3167 tigers in India and we also have project tiger for conservation of tiger tigers in their reserves and it is a centrally sponsored scheme which is under the ministry of environment forest and climate change okay which are there for conservation of these tigers the next topic for the day is Kampala Declaration on Climate Change. What is this Kampala Declaration on Climate Change? 
let us understand that it is a significant step taken by 48 african countries so kampala declaration is to do with african countries and they have adopted adopted this kampala ministerial declaration on migration environment and climate change mecc okay so migration environment and climate change and what is the objective of this declaration it focuses on the interconnection between human mobility and climate change on the continent which continent they are mentioning here africa okay so the decision was discussed at a conference of states which was co-hosted by kenya and uganda and this initiative is supported by two organizations first thing is international organization for migration and then comes un framework convention on climate change okay unfccc next is what is this iom that is international organization on migration it was an organization which was born in the year to uh, in the year 1951 after the chaos and displacement of western europe following second world war after second world war there was huge migration happening in western europe and because of that this organization was created okay to sort any issues related to migration and this migration i mean this organization is supporting this particular initiator <coughs> the kampala declaration next why do they have this declaration that is because africa is highly vulnerable to climate changes impact okay and it is leading to increased migration due to extreme weather events africa is facing a great deal of weather change and then they are facing extreme weather events because of this reason people are migrating to various regions like especially they are moving to europe country european countries okay so that is where the problem happens to address this problem only this declaration has been made and then this declaration was originally signed by 15 african states in kampala uganda in the year 2022 july 2022 and other countries like we saw in the first uh, slide there are there were 48 countries which took part in that conference and all the other countries are expected to sign it during the africa climate summit in nairobi in september 2023 okay in few days it will happen and then this declaration will ensure that all voices including those of youth women and persons with vulnerable situations are heard and this is the major objective of this declaration okay so it becomes important from your exam point of view <clears throat> the next topic for the day is black eagle why is black eagle in news let us understand <coughs> rare black eagle has been sighted for the first time in Chael Wildlife Sanctuary, which is located in Solan district of Himachal Pradesh. Okay, it was sighted for the first time in this particular wildlife sanctuary, Chael Wildlife Sanctuary, which is present in Himachal Pradesh. And this specific species of black eagle has been observed in Chamba region in previous occasions earlier it was observed in chamba region but now it is observed in solan district okay chamba is again a place in a district in himachal pradesh okay so they are notable for their substantial size and unique characteristic what is the unique characteristic here they are found in forested mountainous and hilly regions okay that is the unique characteristic exhibited by black eagle and they are found in indian states of himachal pradesh and jammu and kashmir in north india and when it comes to peninsular india they are found in the forests of eastern and western ghats okay both eastern ghats and western ghats next what is its iucn status <clears throat> as per the iucn its conservation status is least concern which means its population is consistently stable this is that black eagle okay it is a very unique and rare species and coming to the importance of this chael wildlife sanctuary it is home to variety of animals like rhesus macaques leopards indian munchaks what is indian munchak indian munchak is a species of deer and then 
gorals what are gorals here gorals are a species of goat okay and then porcupine wild boars langurs and then himalayan black bears okay so these are the major species which are found in this child wildlife sanctuary and this sanctuary has contributed to the preservation of several endangered species so that is why this wildlife sanctuary becomes important okay wildlife sanctuary where is it located and then the bird species what is its conservation status all those details are important from exam point of view the next topic is methyl autov sorry methyl autov microbium buriatens 5gb1c what is this what is this it is actually a methanotroph what is a methanotroph methanotroph for those bacteria which are going to consume back, uh, i mean methane okay so methane consuming bac bacteria are called as methanotrophs so let us understand what is this methyl autov microbium burea tens 5gb1c <clears throat> so yes there was a journal called proceedings of national academic academy of sciences and in this journal a study was published and this is giving the results that there is a particular strain of bacteria which can remove methane from its major emission sites in one of our previous session i have discussed in greater detail about the methane uh, how is it produced and then where all it is disposed and all those details and how are we going to control what are the steps taken by the government to control methane those i have discussed please go watch it and then in this we are going to see major emission sites of methane that is landfills paddy fields and then oil and gas wells okay so from all these location methane is going to get removed with the help of this bacteria okay so that is what the news is and this bacterial strain demonstrates ability to consume methane that is why they are called as methanotrophs okay and we all know that methane is a potential greenhouse gas which is causing global warming so when we are going to employ this particular bacteria then it will substantially reduce global warming okay <coughs> next is what are the highlights of the study bacterial strains role in methane reduction how it, how it is going to help in methane reduction first thing is they are going to consume methane at low concentration as low as 200 ppm okay and we all know that methane is a greenhouse gas which we already saw and it is going to contribute 30 percentage of the total global warming it is causing 30 percentage of global warming and then it is over 80 times more potent than carbon dioxide all these details I have discussed in that session which i am mentioning okay and then this bacteria has the ability to consume methane even at lower concentration as low as 200 ppm now generally there are other methanotrophs that is methane eating bacteria which will grow only in <coughs> the concentration of around 5000 to 10000 parts per million okay so only when there is concentration of 5000 to 10000 ppm concentration then generally methanotrophs will be growing and then they will be consuming this methane but this particular species of bacteria which we are discussing it is capable of consuming methane even when it is in very low concentration so that is why it is a promising candidate for methane removal technology okay <clears throat> potential impact on global temperature all these points you can directly use in your mains answer writing first thing is when we are going to employ this bacterial strain it will approximately reduce i mean um, 240 million tons of methane will be reduced and it will prevent global warming and this will be done by the year 2050 okay and then this reduction in methane emission could lead to a global average temperature decrease of 0.21 to 0.22 degrees celsius 
so when it comes to global average even very minute increase or decrease in temperature will have a great impact okay so when the temperature is going to reduce to 0.21 to 0.22 degrees celsius even then it is a it will be causing a great impact in our environment okay next utilization of bacterial biomass after consumption of this methane biomass is created okay so as the bacteria consumes methane they generate biomass that can be utilized as a feed for aquaculture very important okay so yet another economy is created here okay for every ton of methane consumed the bacteria can produce 0.78 tons of biomass with dry weight and according to uh, i mean uh, the economic value of this biomass is 1600 us dollars per ton 1600 us dollars per ton and this is an additional benefit of having this particular bacteria okay so all these are important points with respect to this bacteria like we have discussed in every uh, environment session of ours we'll be discussing the basic concepts at least one basic concept of environment okay for today we have aquatic ecosystem so what is aquatic ecosystem what are its classification what are the uh, features of it all those details let us understand <coughs> first thing is aquatic ecosystem what are the major abiotic components of aquatic ecosystem so when there is an ecosystem what is ecosystem in general ecosystem means interaction which is happening between an organism and another organism and also between an organism and its environment so ecosystems key word is interaction any ecosystems key word is interaction interaction between what and what first is organism and organism and then organism and its environment these two interactions are called as the study about this interaction is called as ecology and when it when it operates as a system then it is called as ecosystem so when it comes to aquatic ecosystem there is going to be interaction between organisms and also its environment so like sunlight dissolved oxygen water nutrients these are the major abiotic components of aquatic ecosystem which means it will be influencing the biodiversity in aquatic ecosystem in terrestrial ecosystem water as such becomes an abiotic factor okay so in terrestrial ecosystem water is also an important i mean availability of water is also an important abiotic component but here the system that we are discussing here is aquatic ecosystem where water is everywhere okay everywhere it is water only then only it is an aquatic ecosystem be it ocean or pond or river whatever it is okay so let us get into further more details of it <clears throat> aquatic ecosystem is always three dimensional what are the three dimensions of aquatic ecosystem first thing is dimension 1 what is it it is latitude what is latitude here we all must have known this right equator poles 90 degree 90 degree north and south okay so these are the latitudes 30 60 these horizontal lines are the latitudes so what they are saying with increase in sign of latitude there will be decrease in biodiversity so what is increasing in sign of latitude when we move from equator to the poles then that is called as increase in sign of latitude latitude okay so it can be either way to the north pole or the south pole okay so when we increase the sign of latitude which means when we move from equator to the poles there will be decrease in biodiversity this is a thumb rule that is because like we discussed in the first slide what are all <coughs> the abiotic factors which is going to affect aquatic ecosystem sunlight water nutrients and then what else did we see <coughs> sorry dissolved oxygen yes dissolved oxygen is another abiotic factor right so when there is going to be increase in the sign of latitude then there will be 
decrease in sunlight's availability, there will be decrease in dissolved oxygen and there will also be decrease in water nutrient availability. Okay. So, because of this reason, there is decrease in biodiversity. The second dimension here is longitude. What is longitude? That is the vertical lines. So, these are longitudes. Okay. So, for example, when we consider India, this is Bay of Bengal, okay, and this is Indian Ocean, it is an open ocean, and this is Arabian Sea. Consider Bay of Bengal. Bay of Bengal is longitudinally we can identify it okay from this longitude to this longitude from this longitude to this longitude bay of bengal is present okay so the second dimension here is longitude and it is shoreline to shoreline so from this shoreline to this shoreline that is longitude okay and what is the important point here margins that is coastal areas are more productive than open water so indian ocean here is open water but then this is marginal area okay i mean it is near the coastal waters okay coastal areas the, those regions are called as marginal water bodies okay so those marginal water bodies will be more productive which means biodiversity will be higher in those water bodies when compared to open water here the open water example here is Indian Ocean. Okay, this is because margins have dual nutrient av availability. Okay, so there will be nutrient supply from the rivers from all direction here, and here nutrient availability will be more when it is compared to this region. So when there is higher nutrient availability, there will be higher biodiversity. So this is the second dimension that we are talking. Okay. So, water nutrients and then the nutrient from the neighboring land fed by rivers and sea waves. Okay. Next, the next dimension is the depth. Okay. Here, biodiversity will decrease with increasing depth. Why? What is the reason? That is because of sunlight penetration. Okay. For primary production to happen, sunlight availability is very important. There are three types of lifestyles in an aquatic ecosystem. First is planktonic lifestyle. They are also called as drifters. What are drifters? That are not attached. Any organism or any plants that is not attached to the floor is called as drifters. Okay. So, the best example here is phytoplankton which is a primary producer for which sunlight is required. Next is nectonic. Nectonic means swimmers. All fishes will come under this <coughs> category. Next is benthos. Benthos means attached. Attached means they are attached to the bottom of the floor. I mean, they are attached to the floor of the sea. They are attached to the bottom. They are attached to the floor. So, when we consider like this, planktons will be here at the top. Here also you can find planktons and everywhere you can find Okay, these are the fishes, these are the fishes, these are planktons, okay, these are planktons, they are found here and then benthos means it is attached, these are the three different kinds, okay, so you have planktons, you have nectons or nectonic and then benthos which are attached, okay, so this is how the organisms are classified in aquatic ecosystem. Furthermore, details here, vertical habitats. There are two vertical habitats. Vertically, we can classify the habitat in aquatic ecosystem. First thing is photic zone and the second one is aphotic zone. What is photic zone? Sunlit zone is called as photic zone. It is also called as limnetic zone. That is up to 1200 meter, okay, 1200 meter, it is called as limnetic zone or photic zone which means up to that, that depth sunlight can penetrate and in this photic zone 
it involves both production and respiration loss like we saw earlier sunlight is very much required for primary production to happen so beyond 12000 uh, so i mean 1200 meters i mean below 1200 meters there won't be any sunlight present so primary production cannot happen so it involves both production and respiration loss what is respiration loss this term i have explained in greater detail in one of our previous session so what is respiration loss in general when there is going to be loss of energy when compared to higher tropic level okay so from one tropic level to another tropic level only 10 percentage of the energy is transferred okay this is called as 10 percentage rule we all uh, i have discussed all this in that particular session so there will be loss of energy when we move from one tropic level to another primary producers will be having the highest energy when we go to um, tertiary consumers then there will be lowest energy stored in them okay so it involves both production and the respiration loss this photic zone okay and throughout the photic zone with increasing depth primary production decreases yes there will be higher primary production at the top because sunlight availability here is more when we go deeper and deeper sunlight penetration becomes lesser and lesser that is the reason there is decrease in production and respiration loss is also going to increase with increase in depth next is production becomes zero at this particular depth that is 1200 meters but respiration loss keeps increasing even beyond that depth okay so next is aphotic zone aphotic zone means darker zone i'll explain this in the picture in the next slide okay so what is aphotic zone it is dark zone it is also called as profundal zone this is limnetic zone and this is profundal zone and it is up to 4000 meter here 4000 meter is the average depth of ocean water okay and in this zone there is only respiration loss and there is no primary production happening that is because there is no penetration of sunlight only respiration loss happens okay you must have to link all these basic concepts that i am explaining with the previous basic concepts that i have explained so that you will get a continuity okay next is the marine biome you have photic zone and aphotic zone and this depth is 1200 meters and this depth is 4000 meters okay this is average photic zone and aphotic zone and up to this depth only there is availability of sunlight beyond that or below that there won't be any availability of sunlight thus respiration loss will get increased i mean as it goes below but then there won't be any production happening okay by production we mean production of food or <clears throat> life next is critical depth what is critical depth that 1200 meter distinction that we are making right that is, is called as critical depth so the depth at which primary production ends or it becomes zero is called as critical depth and it is the boundary between photic and aphotic zone so critical depth is the boundary between photic and aphotic zone and at critical depth decreasing primary production sorry at critical depth decreasing primary production and increasing respiration loss tend to be in balance yes obviously right so there is decrease in primary production from the top let us consider this to be mean sea level and this is 1200 meters primary production keeps decreasing and then even below this point there will be decrease in respirational loss and even here there is observation of respiration loss but primary production becomes zero at this point primary production is equal to zero at this particular point that is called as critical depth and at this critical depth there is a balance between primary production and then respirational loss happening okay next based on these lifestyles vertical habitats are classified as two more that is pelagic and benthic pelagic means off the bottom which is above the bottom and then benthic means on the bottom which is on the bottom okay it can be both photic and aphotic pelagic can be photic and aphotic uh, when you <coughs> see the picture pelagic can be found here or here the only condition here for 
pelagic organisms is or pelagic zone is they are not on the bottom okay which means they are off the bottom which means they are above the bottom but benthos means they are on the bottom which is which means they are attached to the bottom okay so pelagic is both photic and aphotic but benthic is always aphotic okay because they are attached to the bottom such distinctions you need to understand okay so it will always be aphotic or aphotic is also called as profundal right so yes next all these statements are important from exam point of view directly they can be asked first thing is over and above critical depth biodiversity will go on increasing yes it will go on increasing over and above critical depth okay so when we move upward critical depth this is critical depth when we move upward there will be increase in biodiversity yes next is when moving from mean sea level to critical depth biodiversity decreases with increase in depth the opposite okay so mean sea level is here okay so when we move from here to here then uh, biodiversity decreases next is below critical depth biodiversity will go on decreasing with increasing depth yes okay when we go below critical depth there will be decrease in biodiversity next thus in aquatic ecosystem so all this is depth dependent right so aquatic ecosystem production is depth dependent but respirational loss is independent of depth which means respirational loss continuously decreases when we go below but production up to this point only below that there won't be any production happening okay so such distinctions you must have to understand very clearly next is biodiversity will be higher in photic zone in compared to in comparison to a photic zone obviously even in a photic zone there will be biodiversity but then biodiversity will be considerably lesser that is because primary production will be happening here here there won't be primary production there will only be respirational loss so biodiversity in this region will be very higher when compared to this region okay so this uh, these are the important points which you must have to understand with respect to aquatic ecosystem i hope you found this session to be very useful and informative let us see in the next class thank you